is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Africa News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for Pan-African news and world developments. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Coming up on African News Tonight... Chidima is facing six counts of corrupt practices by a public officer profiting from government contracts and failing to make a full report. That's Lamek Masina reporting on the arrest of Malawi's Vice President Saulos Chilema. Details coming up. Also, Sao Tome's government reports a coup attempt. And Sunny Young brings us up to date on World Cup action. We'll have these stories and more on African News tonight. We start with our top story. In the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, the M23 militant group today appeared to have reversed course on a ceasefire. Earlier, the rebels had rejected a ceasefire that leaders of Congo, Rwanda, Burundi and Angola signed this week in Luanda. They met to try to end a surge in fighting in the eastern DRC, which has forced thousands of to flee their homes. The M23, made up mostly of members of the Tutsi ethnic community, was not part of those talks and earlier said it was not bound by the agreement. The deal called for a ceasefire to begin at 5 p.m. local time today. Reporter Jazaf J- Jafar al Katanti is in Goma in the eastern DRC. He spoke a short time ago with my colleague Kate Pound Dawson about the M23 statement. He says the M23 kept the country waiting for today. Uh, when all locals of Goma and Eastern Congo in general was waiting to 6 p.m. to see the reaction of M23 and they changed their position. Now they accept the ceasefire with a no official statement from the M23 and signed by their president himself. And in which they accept uh, the ceasefire but with the condition they want to sit with Kinshasa and talk, participate in the Nairobi peace talks. Because after the Rwanda peace talks, there is another peace talk in Nairobi and M23 wants to participate. But what we know is that the government of DRC will not accept because yesterday the Congolese foreign minister uh, Congolese Minister of Foreign Affairs said that the M23 is not invited on all peace talks because they are recognized as a terrorist. And M23, when accepting the ceasefire, they don't mention in their statement that they will leave the occupied zone. And the recommendation from the Luanda peace talks was that they have to sign the ceasefire today before 6 p.m. and then leave the occupied zone. The M23 made no mention of leaving occupied areas. What does that mean in terms of fighting? You had, there was earlier fighting today. Is there still fighting? Uh, the information we have is like, they don't fighting at this moment, even if they fight it today. But in their statement, they say they won't accept if anything happens in their zone. As they say that they are fighting for the Tutsi community. They say in their statement, if there is an attack from FRDC or FDLR or some other my my groups in from eastern congo attack the city they were they occupied they will also respond militarily so uh this is fire is just a kind of let's see the next uh they accept it to uh call the government of drc to invite them in a peace talk in nairobi that was Jafar al Katanti reporting from Goma. He was speaking to VOA's Kate Pound Dawson. There are more than 100 rebel groups operating in the eastern DRC, and the M23 is one of the largest. 
The Prime Minister of the West African island nation of Sao Tome and Principe said an attempted coup was averted early Friday morning after an attack on army headquarters. Mohamed Yusuf reports from VOA's Africa News Center in Nairobi, Kenya. The Sao Tome and Principe government says it foiled a coup attempt as four men, including the former president of the outgoing National Assembly, Delphi Neves, tried to attack army headquarters. Sao Tome and Principe Prime Minister Patrice Travoada announced the arrest of four men. One of them was a former military officer who attempted a coup in 2009. The West African Regional Bloc, the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, condemned the coup attempt. The head of the bloc, Guinea-Bissau President Omaro Sissoko Mbalo, tweeted that Sao Tome and Principe is a model of parliamentary democracy in Africa. The Independent Democratic Action, ADI, led by Travada, won legislative elections in September. The previous ruling party, the Movement for the Liberation of Sao Tome and Principe, lost the election by 11,000 votes. Since the last attempted military coup in 2003, the West African country had enjoyed relative political stability. Mohamed Yusuf for VA News, Nairobi. Malawi's Vice President Saulus Chelima is out on bail after his arrest and connection with alleged kickbacks. It's the latest in a series of arrests of officials suspected of corruption. Tamek Masina reports from Blantyre, Malawi. Malawi's Anti-Corruption Bureau says Chelima received payments amounting to 280,000 U.S. dollars and other items from British businessman Thunus Sata in return for awarding Malawi government contracts. The Bureau says Chirima received kickbacks between March 2021 and October 2021 after awarding Malawi Defense Force and Malawi Police Service contracts to two companies connected to Sata. Chirima is facing six counts of corrupt practices by a public officer profiting from government contracts and failing to make a full report to officers of the Bureau. In June, Malawi President Lazarus Yakwera suspended the powers of the Vice President after the country's anti-corruption Bureau accused the Chilima of accepting kickbacks in return for government contracts. The Chief Residence Magistrate Court in the capital, Lilongwe, granted the Chilima bail. Among the conditions of his release is that he reports to the anti-corruption Bureau every three months. Lamik Masina for VUA News, Blanta, Malawi. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Police in Nigeria's all reach Niger Delta say gunmen dressed in military uniforms have killed three police escorts and abducted an oil executive. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja, Nigeria. River State Police spokesperson Grace Iringe Koko told VOA Friday that the police command has launched investigations into the killings and abduction to find the perpetrators. She said the motive behind the attack is unclear and no group had claimed responsibility. Iringe Koko said the gunmen, disguised in military attire, ambushed two vehicles transporting the officers and a senior oil executive on Thursday around the Rumokoro flyover bridge in Port Harcourt, the state capital. They shot the officers and escaped with the oil executive in a vehicle. Police authorities said the abducted executive worked for the domestic oil and gas company IGPES Group based in the area. The company has yet to issue a statement on the incident. Iringa Koko spoke to VOA via phone. Investigation is ongoing. Already the CP has uh, deployed tactical team to that hand, and investigation is ongoing. The DC State TID has been directed to carry out discrete investigation on it. Kidnapping for ransom is a major security challenge in Nigeria that authorities are struggling to address. River State is an oil-rich area in the Niger Delta region. It has seen activity by rebels who say they are protesting neglect and pollution of their environment by years of oil exploration. Wealthy oil workers and business people are often targeted by armed gangs there and across the nation. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. 
Uganda schools are closing for the Christmas holiday two weeks early because of deadly Ebola infections, although officials say there have been no new infections in 10 days. Halima Tumani reports from Kampala. By Friday, all schools in Uganda had sent children home. The early closure was one of the measures the government took to curb the spread of the Ebola outbreak, reported in August, that has so far claimed 55 lives. Uganda's Ministry of Health says the reduction includes both the epicenter towns of Movende and Kasanda and cases imported into the Kampala, Masaka and Jinja districts. Lieutenant Colonel Henry Chove, the Health Ministry Incident Commander speaking to VOA by phone, said overall the picture in the country looks very promising, but caution remains high. We are moving actually towards the end of this outbreak. I can't say when, but with a significant reduced force of infection, we are certainly sure that we are moving in the right direction. The possibility of imported cases across Uganda becomes slimmer and slimmer or none. Chobe said the country will only be considered safe after two incubation cycles from the last case. In the past seven days, authorities had 4,473 contacts under follow-up, but Chobe says the numbers have significantly dropped to 200. Previously, authorities struggled to convince contacts to report to health centers, something Chobe said has now changed because of sensitization. And if you die, if we missed you alive, we'll pick you because we have an elaborate mortality surveillance system where all bodies in the epicenter district are actually tested for Ebola. So we think the law is real. This is not an artifact of hidden cases not coming to us. The Ebola outbreak in Uganda also saw a high number of cancellations of tourist visits. President Hiram Seven in a speech to Ugandans November 16th said he had received reports of tourists cancelling visits to Uganda, which he described as unnecessary and unfortunate. By mid-November, Uganda had registered 141 confirmed cases of the deadly Ebola Sudan strain virus. Halima Othmani for VA News, Kampala, Uganda. There are celebrations today in Senegal after the Teranga Lions sank the host team Qatar 3-1 at the World Cup. VOA's Abdurrahman Dia is in Dakar and this fan tells him that he knew this match would show Senegal is the better team and he now has hope the team will make it into the next round. For a look at today's sports. <laughs> You just heard the celebrations today in Senegal after the the, the Taranga Lions sank the host team Qatar 3-1. For a look at today's actions, we have VOA Sonny Young on the line. Hello, Sonny. Sporty World Cup greetings, Jehaeus. So another exciting day, World Cup soccer. Let's well, hear yeah, all the details. You know, uh, <laughs> delightful day. Delightful day for Senegal. There you have two Ds. Delightful day. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, hey, so it was really a triple D kind of day for Senegal. Dia, Dia Du, and Dieng scored the goals for Senegal and uh, makes Group A very interesting, yeah, hey, And I would like to go over the results so far from Friday. Senegal defeated host Qatar 3-1. That eliminates Qatar uh, from advancing. Also in Group A, the Netherlands and Ecuador drew one all. And in Group B, Iran defeated Wales by a score of 2-0. So where do we stand in Group A, Yehaeus? Well, the Netherlands and Ecuador are at the top of the group with four points from two matches. Senegal is right behind them with three points from two matches. And as I mentioned, Qatar has been eliminated. So basically, everything hinges on Senegal's final group match on November 29th, Yeheus, when they'll play Ecuador. And they'll be looking to advance with a victory. Now, as we look at that group, 
if Ecuador draws with Senegal on November 29th, uh, Ecuador will advance because they're, uh, they're one point ahead of Senegal. But, yeah, I think this was a really good performance by the Taranga Lions, Yeah. Uh, they started the tournament without their inspirational captain, the injured Sadio Mane, but they showed on Friday that they really have a lot of talent and heart as they defeated host Qatar. And, Yeheus, you can make the argument that all four goals in that match were scored by African players because Qatar's goal came from a Ghana-born mm-hmm. player, yes. Mohamed Muntari. Mohamed Muntari, born in Kumasi, Ghana, and he has been playing for Qatar uh, for about the past eight years at the international level. Sonny, I found uh, Mendy, the goalkeeper of Senegal, very impressive today. You know, I, I agree with you, Yehaz, and Mendy, I, I think, would have to be rated among the best goalkeepers uh, in the world, uh, and especially right now at this World Cup as, as the uh, Lions try to advance. Uh, so, yeah, I think he's going to be key. Uh, Senegal, they are the reigning African champions. Uh, they have a very good defense, and hopefully that defense will continue to play uh, strongly when they play their last group match against Ecuador. But that's going to be key. Uh, that match against Ecuador, whether they can advance to the next round. And I know, I know there's a few Africa News Tonight listeners, Yeheus, that remember the Taranga Lions advancing to the quarterfinals at the 2002 World Cup in Japan and South Korea. So it would be great to see them duplicate that achievement. And also the Iran Wales. Uh, Iran played uh, amazing, uh, winning what two nil, two nil victory uh, by uh, Iran. Uh, both goals, interestingly, came in the final moments of the match. Uh, Stechmi and Rezalan with the goals for Iran. Uh, we have another team from the Middle East, Yehias, uh, playing well on. I mean, I won't call it home home turf, but I, I believe there is an advantage for these teams from the Middle East playing in Qatar. Uh, yes. We have Saudi Arabia with the biggest upset so far at the uh, at the World Cup. Uh, we also have Morocco and Tunisia, uh, Arab speaking. They they are definitely still in position to advance to the knockout rounds. But Group B, very interesting right now. Yeah, yes, because Iran is currently in second place in Group B with three points from two matches. The final match on Friday will feature England going against the United States. England is currently uh, on top of the group uh, with three points from one match. Uh, they have not played that second match like Iran has. Uh, so, yeah, Iran could possibly go through to the knockout round, yeah, yes. So England and the USA, let's talk a little about that. Uh, what do you think? Uh, how's the USA, uh, how, how will it fare against England? Yeah, yes, I, I, I believe the USA is, is a big underdog going into this match against England. In fact, uh, more than a few England fans have said that it's going to be a rout against the American team. Uh, we'll have to wait and see uh, from an African angle. The American team got their goal against Wales in their first match from none other than Tim Weah, the son of Liberia's president, George Weah. And uh, I know a, a few Liberians, Yehaz, have very mixed feelings about Tim Weah playing for the USA. They, they kind of wish that he was playing for the Lone Star <laughs> exactly. of Liberia. Yes, yes. But, uh, <laughs> but he's not. He's been, he's been playing for the uh, USA uh, all his life, uh, he was born in New York City. He'll be a factor in the uh, match against England, Yehaz, but perhaps an even bigger factor will be uh, Christian Pulisic. He set up Wea in the first match against Wales. He set up the goal by Wea. He's the spark plug for the American team, and he's going to have to really uh, have a great match for the USA to beat England in this last match on Friday. Uh, so I, I would say 
England is the betting favorite uh, in that match, Yes, but uh, we are the voice of America, so go USA. Go USA. Go USA. <laughs> and with that, Sonny, I thank you for your input again. <laughs> thank you, Yes, and a 40 weekend to all of our Africa News Tonight listeners. Thank you. Next, an editorial reflecting the views of the United States government. The United States remains committed to the Cuban people in their pursuit of freedom, prosperity, and a future with greater dignity, said John Kelly, U.S. political counselor at the United Nations. We are focused on the political and economic well-being of the Cuban people and center our efforts on democracy and human rights and fundamental freedoms. Cubans of all walks of life are speaking out for fundamental freedoms, protesting Cuban government repression and advocating for a better future. In July of 2021, the world witnessed tens of thousands of Cubans across the island take to the streets to peacefully demand freedom. In response to these nonviolent demonstrations, the Cuban government arrested protesters and handed down harsh prison sentences, even against minors, said Councillor Kelly. It resorted to intimidation tactics, internet disruptions, government-sponsored mobs, and forced journalists and human rights defenders into exile. The United States government is holding the Cuban regime accountable for these and other human rights abuses and violations by continuing to leverage targeted sanctions on those responsible for human rights abuses, while improving our policies to maximize benefit to the Cuban people. For example, in June 2022, the U.S. government eliminated caps on family remittances and reinstated non-family remittances to Cuba, which will benefit Cuban families, entrepreneurs, and marginalized communities, such as Afro-Cubans. As Councillor Kelly noted, our policies include exemptions and authorizations relating to exports of food, medicine, and other humanitarian goods to Cuba. We recognize the challenges the Cuban people face. The people of the United States and U.S. organizations donate a significant amount of humanitarian goods to the Cuban people, and the United States is one of Cuba's principal trading partners. Since 1992, the United States has authorized billions of dollars of exports to Cuba, including food and other agricultural commodities, medicines, medical devices, telecommunications equipment, consumer goods, and other items to support the Cuban people. In 2021 alone, U.S. companies exported over $295 million worth of agricultural goods to Cuba, including food, to help address the Cuban people's basic needs. We join international partners in urging the Cuban government to release political prisoners immediately and unconditionally and to protect the freedoms of expression and peaceful assembly of all individuals in Cuba, said Councillor Kelly. The United States stands with the Cuban people and will continue to seek ways to provide meaningful support to them. That was an editorial reflecting the views of the United States government. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington.